Thank you, Father. We can do nothing without you. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you because you're a God who loves us. Because of your great love, we are here to learn of you, to seek your face, that we may find you in our hearts. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to remain on the mind. Lord, we pray that you give us understanding by your spirit. Speak through me, let the anointing flow. Your word says, let rivers of living, rivers of, rivers of living water shall flow from your innermost being. I pray that what is already deposited in my spirit will flow out. And what you would give by the moment through spontaneity will flow out as well. So I just open myself to you, surrender myself to you, Lord. I pray that you have your way. Speak to me, use me as a vessel, and bless every one of us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'll be teaching this course on the renewing of the mind. And uh, the main scripture for the renewing of the mind is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Amen. So can we read that together? It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect so we're going to be dissecting this scripture during this class. And there are different aspects to this. There are different aspects to this, 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 uh, renew, this course on renewing of the mind. So a few things I'd like to highlight. Number one is transformation. Transformation. There a lot of things we would highlight in the course, but one of them, which we really like to focus today, is transformation. Amen. Another one is not being conformed to the world. So we don't want to be conformed. The Bible says if you if you are renewed in your mind, you will not conform to the world. And then the other major one is the will of God. You know. These are three very important things in this topic. So, and of course, the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. So, we, I will try to, I will try to divide the course, the, the class, into about three different topics. And each week we will speak on one. Each week we will speak on one, but... Today we will try to focus a bit on transformation. Next week, hopefully, we'll be able to talk about what the will of God is. And then the, the, the last week, we will talk about how to transform your mind, how to renew your mind. Some practical examples of how to renew your mind. Amen. So let's dissect this a little bit. Before we get to next week to talk about the will of God. Let me just give some little background that when the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In another scripture it says it's your reasonable act of worship. So when you present your body as a living sacrifice, it's in the purpose of living a life of worship unto God. And it says, do not be conformed to this world. And we know that Jesus did not conform to the world. And because Jesus did not conform to the world, we don't have to conform to the world. We are in the world, the Bible says, but not of the world. So many times, as Christians, we don't have to do things just because the world does it. So 
So this course will provoke our hearts and our minds and challenge us to think before we act. Before we, we, we align ourselves to what other people do, think first. Pray about it. What does the Bible say about it before you do it? You know, I like to think of myself as somebody who likes to think outside the box. And one of the examples of that is the Bible school being tuition free. It's thinking outside the box. I know that in today's society, everything it has a dollar amount. If we want to go to a Bible school, we want to know how was the value of that, that Bible school. If we want to go to the shop, we want to know how much we'll spend. Everything has a dollar amount. But I realized that the revelation that God gave me, the Bible says the gospel shall be preached to the poor. Jesus told John the Baptist, uh, when, when John the Baptist sent three men to come and meet Jesus, or men, people to come and meet Jesus and ask, are you the one who should come or should we wait for another? Jesus said, the blind see, he healed the sick, he performed some miracles. He said, go and tell John the Baptist, the blind see, the deaf hear, the kingdom is preached to the poor, and blessed is the one who is not offended in me. You know, what I'm trying to point out from that scripture is that the Bible says the gospel is being preached to the poor, which means Everybody has supposed to have access to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Everybody is supposed to have access to discipleship. Mm -hmm. If we put a fee on discipleship, then we are not let, we, we're not making it open to everybody. It's only open to those who can afford it. I thought to myself, what if Peter could not pay his fee? Would Jesus have kicked him out of the class? <laughs> you know, this course would help us think outside the box. Because when Jesus, when Peter, when, when Jesus called Peter, he called him out of fishing. So how was Peter supposed to make a living? He used to make a living by fishing. Now you've called him out of fishing and you want him to pay a fee. Where is that fee going to come from? <laughs> and the Bible says that parents lay down for their children. Children don't lay down for parents. And so we see the example of Jesus when Jesus, P Peter came to Jesus and said, they're asking us to pay taxes. Jesus said, go to the water, cast your net this way and catch a fish and take the coin that comes out from the mouth and pay for you and for me. So Jesus is telling us that not only has he called Peter, but he's able to provide for Peter's needs. So today, in today's society, everything is about the dollar, but we have to think outside the box. We have to help let the Holy Spirit give us the thoughts of God. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. We have to explore the mind of Christ. And it is okay to be a little different. It is okay to be a little different. I remember I was talking to somebody at the church, and they, they, they seemed to have the idea that you have to have fees. I said, then no, <laughs> this is not what I want to do. This is not what is in my, my heart. It's not in the blueprint. You know, when God gives you a vision, he gives you a blueprint like he did with Moses. When he, he called Moses, he said, build this temple, this tabernacle. Let it be exactly as you see it. The design is there. So when God gives you a vision, your vision will have a blueprint. And believe it or not, Anything that deviates from that blueprint, you will know. I remember when we started the Bible school, the pastor in my church offered the building for free. And this is a prophet. He's a man of God. He's a man who hears God and speaks to God. But learn this from me. Do not submit your vision to the authority of another person if it's not in line with the blueprint that God gave you. And I'm going to tell you why. There's the, the story in the Bible of the old prophet and the, the young prophet. The old prophet had a vision, a prophecy. God said, go to this land and prophesy. Do this exactly. Do not live by the way you came. 
Do not eat. Just go proclaim my word and leave. That was the blueprint. He went, he did the miracle, he prophesied, he, things happened, God moved, and he was obeying God and moving. Then the older prophet came and sent his children and said, go and tell him to come. And then he said, no, God told me not to eat. Come and eat. He said, God told me not to eat in this city. God told me not to eat in this city. And then the man said, but God has told me that you ought to come and eat now. You see, when he went and ate, what happened? The, the, the old prophet, who was not hearing from God again, now got a word from God that because you disobeyed God, you are going to die. The lion will eat you out of the city and will eat you. So your, your vision comes with a blueprint. Your calling comes with the blueprint. And whenever you deviate from that blueprint, you will know. Let me give you an example. My pastor came to me three times. Three times. At the beginning of this vision and said, you can use our building for free. How many of us think that that's a good thing? No. It's a good thing to, to use your building for free. Amen. So, three times I told him no. That is not the blueprint of God for the Bible school. We had, we had not even started. We did not have one student. I told him that is not the blueprint of God for this vision. This vision is supposed to be held in an interdenominational place. A place I did not have. Why was it supposed to be held in an interdenominational place? Because we are going to be receiving people from various churches. One of them I did not have. <laughs> We're going to be welcoming and receiving people from various churches and they need to feel comfortable. It has to be a neutral place. The mindset that we want to take you to our church just has to, has to die. One, the, one of the things in the blueprint was that God wanted us to break the church mentality, the, the, the walls, so that people can come together without fear of stealing sheep. So people don't feel we want to steal sheep. So it was very clear in the blueprint of God. It was extremely clear. You cannot, you cannot negotiate. There are some things about your vision you don't negotiate. You don't listen to the old prophet. No matter how big the old prophet is, you don't listen to the old prophet. Because you have a blueprint. You, if you don't have a blueprint, you don't have a vision. When you have a vision, you have a blueprint that comes with it. It's like... How can I say? You have a car, it comes with a key. You have a house, it comes with a key. That blueprint keeps you, it preserves you, and you know, you know deep inside that that's my blueprint. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I said no three times, and then in desperation, we're still looking for a place. People say, but we offered you a place. We're still looking for a place. I mean, are you not hearing me? And so, we got a place. It was interdenominational. One of the ladies got a dream about us. And then she said, we know a guy who has a ministry that is interdenominational. He deals with youth from various churches. Can you come and see his place? So we went to his place. And that's where we launched the Bible school. That year, first year, January 15, 2015, we met in a room a little bit bigger than this for the first time. And we had... A lot of people just show up and God led us through that year. So that was the first year of the Bible school. My pastor still came to me. Do you want to hold your Bible school in the church? So this is the second year. Second year we need two classrooms. Where we were had only one classroom. So our year was over. The next year we're supposed to have year one and year two. Then I prayed and said, God, the church is offering us a place for free. What are we going to do? Are we going to take it and break the blueprint? Or are we going to keep searching? Because the search was difficult. It was difficult to find a place that was right. It was difficult. You call the community hall, they will tell you, you can have three Thursdays, but the fourth Thursday is taken by another group. 
and so he was he was to be God. Mm -hmm. So I prayed, and this is what I got. I got a dream where I saw myself passing through uh, a traffic light, and on that traffic light, the lights came green, and one of them was this a small green light somewhere, and I passed. And then I was thinking, God, maybe you're giving me green light to use the church. Then I know it's not in the blueprint. But if you're giving me green light, what I did not realize was that it was a small green light. I really remember, I told, I told my wife, I saw a small green light. And so I, I, I took the pastor's offer and I stepped out of the blueprint of God. You know, the Bible says that, or oh, I have learned the hard way that there's a small device that drives a car that you, you put in your car and it gives you direction. It's, it's called the, the GPS. It's the geographical positioning system. And God has his own GPS, but this one is called God's positioning system. <laughs> and the GPS would lead you. And when it miss your way, it would tell you, make the next left. Make, make the, less, the next right. Make a U-turn and go back to your destination. It has never told me you're lost or you cannot find your way again. You're totally gone. Forget it. I, I, I wish, sometimes I wish my, my GPS would have told me that, but it does not. Amen. Amen. And so, God is greater than the GPS. He will redirect you even when you miss your way, when you lose your way. So, I went to the church, and this is a church of 500 something people. Our first class, we had about six students. Six students. Everybody was saying, come, come, come to our church. We would come, come. From 25 that we graduated, which means we had more, mm -hmm. to, to six to start with. Mm -hmm. I went to the Lord. I said, God, are we going to survive teaching six people for one year? Mm -hmm. And I received peace in my spirit. You're going to survive. And so we offered the program as full as we could for six people. And that was the first time we had six and six graduated. God sustained the six. And after that year, we were supposed to reconsider our alignment. So they told me, come and do it in our church. Absolutely not. <laughs> we would rather perish. We've learned our lesson the hard way. So they, they, they did what they could. We searched and we found another place. We found a place called Evergreen Community Spaces. And we went there, we rented, and the class exploded again. That was when I think Wanda came. I don't remember when you came. I came, it was my second year, so... Oh, been, yeah, the third time. Okay. Yeah, so okay. They, yeah, yeah. Some people I knew for the first time that it was full. Yeah. It was a lot better. And so there is... I'm, I'm saying this story to say that we don't have to be conformed to the world. You have to have the, the mind of Christ in what you do. Yes. And you have to stay true to the blueprint. God told Moses, do exactly... Build the tabernacle exactly as you saw me explain it to you. Because it was a shadow of the tabernacle that was in heaven. It was just not symbolic. It was exactly how heaven looked like. Mm. God told him to build the tabernacle exactly as it was in heaven. And so he had to obey that, obey that blueprint. So in Christianity, we don't have to conform. We have to think outside the box. We have the mind of Christ. Jesus was a non-conformist. When he went to the temple, he went to the temple to win souls. He went to the temple to preach the gospel. He did not go to the temple to, to follow the rituals of the Pharisees. When he came to the Sabbath day, a day when there was no work, and he knew the rules, he knew the regulation, because he wrote it in the Bible, in the Old Testament. When he came to the Sabbath, he broke the law. He broke the law. The law of the Sabbath. 
They say on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to pick your bed. You're not supposed to do any kind of work. But Jesus told that man, pick up your bed and go. And then the Pharisees met him and they said, but why are you picking up your bed? He said, the man who healed me said, pick up your bed. So who do I obey? Do I obey the one who healed me? Or do I obey you who did not heal me? I've been here with you on Sabbath and on, on weekdays. You have never healed me. <laughs> Somebody has healed me and said, pick up my bed. Why would I not follow him? Yeah. You know? So he was a non-conformist. And I'm just trying to encourage us tonight as an introduction that we must not follow everything that the world says. And we must not follow everything that the church says. We must not follow everything that the pastor says. We have to read for ourselves. Believe for ourselves. Have your own conviction. Seek God until you know what he has said to you specifically. That is your blueprint. And you, you keep that, you are true to that till the end. Remember the story of the old prophet. You don't want to let somebody lead you astray. Because sometimes these old prophets, they know. That God is using you and they don't want you to be used by God. Somehow, Hallelujah. they would want you to be deceived, to be led astray so that the lion can consume you. Mm. For empty reasons, mm. for jealousy reasons. Mm. Do you know that the Bible says Jesus was killed out of jealousy? Yeah. Yeah. The Pharisees were so jealous that God was working in his life. Mm. They wanted him out of the way. So do not conform. But the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I just wanted to mention before we get there that there are about two levels. There are two different categories of the will of God. There are two different categories of the will of God. One of them, one, one of them is called the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God is unchangeable. Whether it rains or it sounds or whatever happens, the sovereign will of God will come to pass. When God has said it would happen, it will happen. That is called the sovereign will of God. Amen. There's also, number two, what is called the moral will of God. The moral will of God is God's commandment. What he has said will come to pass, or that we should do. For example, he says, do not steal. So if you do not steal, you are doing the will of God. Do not commit adultery. If you do not commit adultery, you are doing the will of God. But it's called the moral will of God. And because it's the moral will of God, it can be broken. It, it, it is dependent on your obedience. And this Moral will of God has a subcategory that I, I can call the, the permissive. The permissive will of God. And this is what I believe the Bible is really talking about. It says, do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know the permissive will of God. The, the will of God that is not written in, in black and white. For example, the Bible says that Jesus had to be crucified. Because Jesus had to be crucified, he had to give himself as a sacrifice from the book of Isaiah. The prophets had prophesied that the Messiah was going to come and die. That was the sovereign will of God. Nothing could change God's plan. So when you want to be conformed and be transformed, by the renewing of your mind to prove what is, that, the, what is that perfect will of God. It's not usually the sovereign will of God because the sovereign will of God is not dependent on you. It's dependent on God. It's what God has said will come to pass. For example, if God says there will be rain today, there will be rain today. If God says there will be sun, there will be sun. If God says somebody is dying today in the southeast, that person is dying in the southeast no matter how much you but when God is talking about that, he's talking about the moral and the permissive will of God. And these are things that are not hard and fast on the word of God. For example, my wife's name is not written in the Bible. 
There's no place I can read in the Bible that tells me that my wife will be called Sally. It's not written in the Bible. So how do you find that woman? How do you find it? So you need to be not to be conformed. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can be able to prove, test what the will of God for your life is in a particular situation. And that is what the renewing of the mind helps you to do. When your mind is renewed, you can walk through life knowing which path God wants you to take. When you come to a double road, you can know which way God wants you to go. When you want to get married, you need to be able to discern what God's will for your life is. Amen. There are some clues that help us to find out what God's will is for our lives. But you cannot get to those clues without first of all renewing your mind. You know, we've learned in this course We've learned in this course that man is a spirit. So let me draw man here. This looks a lot like me. Man is a spirit that has a soul and lives in a body. Oh. We've learned that the spirit is the part of man that connects with God. This part of man was dead before the new birth. Dead, like dead. And because this part was dead, it was your spirit and your, your soul and your body that you navigated life. Every information you ever received, every action you ever did was between your soul and your body. So which means that you have plenty of things that are going on in your life, even when you get born again, that are soulish and worldly. When you now get born again, you have a lot of work to do to catch up. To catch up. Some of us took 20 years to get saved. So for 20 years, we have been feeding on junk. We have been feeding our minds with junk. Our bodies and our souls have been determining how we, we operate. And now we've gotten born again and our spirit is suddenly alive. And if you know, when a little baby is born, they start to creep. They start to drink milk. They are not yet fully mature. They cannot make decisions of their own. That is about the level where our spirits are. And we need the renewing of our minds. To be able to help us grow. You know, the, this course we are talking about is on the renewing of the mind. And the mind is in the soul. Our spirits are born again, which means that it, cannot, it cannot get better than that. Our spirits are alive. They are born again. The Bible says our souls are being renewed day by day. It has to do with feeding on the word. It has to do with the information that goes into the mind, the information that goes into the soul. The Bible says this body, we await the redemption of the mortal bodies, which means our bodies are not born again. They are not born again. The Bible says we await the redemption of the mortal bodies, which means when Christ comes, we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And when we are changed, the Bible says, there will be no more death. There will be no more pain, no more crying, no more tears. But until then, until then, Paul says, I mortify my flesh. I put my body under subjection. I beat it. I press it. I fast. I deny my body the pleasures that it wants to have. Galatians says it great. It says there's a battle between the spirit and the body. These two war against each other. The spirit wants to take you towards God. The body wants to take you towards the world. 
And 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says the devil is the god of this world. If you're going towards the world, you're going towards the devil. If you're going towards your spirit, your spirit is going towards God. So this soul becomes the referee, the umpire that determines where you actually go. That's why the renewing of the mind is so important. Because your spirit cannot do it alone when these two team up against you. <laughs> the real you is inside of you. The real you is your spirit. But when these two team up against your spirit, they drag him. They drag him to the world. But when these two team up against the body, then you bring your body into subjection. Your body just becomes a vehicle. Let me give you one illustration that the Bible says. The Bible says when God made Adam and Eve, they were naked. Yeah. They did not even realize they were naked. Because their bodies was just a vehicle for the earth. It was just being used to walk, eat, sleep. They saw life from their spirits. Because they were spirits, this body meant nothing. So being naked did not mean anything to them. They, they knew they were spirit. That had a soul and lives in the body in that order. In that order. So when they see and this part died, the Bible says their eyes open and they realize they were naked. I ask the question, were they blind before? They were not blind before. They were able to see. In fact, Adam named all the animals. So he could see what eye opened. What eye opened? When the spiritual eyes closed, then they could see only through the eyes of the, the body. And that's why the Bible says they, their eyes opened. Then they realized, oh, I'm naked. Because there had been a death. Jesus, God said, the day you eat this fruit, you will die. This day, they died spiritually. And as they died spiritually, it was these two that were negotiating life. It was between the body and the soul. And all the children they gave birth to were born in this nature. Their first sons, Cain and Abel, one murdered the other. Why? Because it was only the soul and the body that were determining everything they do. And these two, when they pair up, they are no good. They are no good. That's why we have to renew our minds. Because when we renew our minds, we are empowering our spirit. Mm -hmm. What goes into the soul is extremely important in the Christian race. That's why the Bible says, God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Mm -hmm. You shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will have your way prosperous and you will be successful. So, what goes into your soul is really important. Now you are a child of God. Imagine you are a child of God and you feed your mind with pornography. You are born again. And you are feeding on pornography. What are you feeding? You are feeding your, your soul. Pornography fills your mind and empowers your body. It fills your mind and empowers your body. So the battle between the spirit and the body is being won by the body. Your soul pairs up with the body and pulls you to the world, pulls you to the devil. Before you know, you are in a nightclub. Before you know, you're asking a lady out. And you know you're doing the wrong thing, but you have you seem to have no power. Paul said, I I what I want to do, I do not do. What I do not want to do, that I do. Why? Because there's no strength in the spirit. There's no strength in the spirit because these two are pairing up against him. You fed yourself with so much junk that these two team up. The, 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 the soul is like a referee, like an umpire. It's a very just umpire. Why do I say he's very just? Because he looks at the body. And he looks at the spirit and he sees who is stronger. Mm -hmm. And he follows. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. He looks at who is stronger and he 
follows. And so when these two team up against the body, then you move in the direction of God. That's why the renewing of the mind is very important. The, the soul has the will. This is very important. <laughs> Can you see this? Your soul is the seat of your will. The seat of your will is not in your spirit. It's in your soul. Your will. It is your will that will desire to do the will of God. Do you see that? It is your will that wants to do the will of God. So, it's not the spirit. It's in the soul. It's in the soul. Your will, in your soul, there is the emotions. The emotions. And the intellect. So many people think that the solution for the soul is education. So they feed the soul with information. They feed the soul with knowledge. You go to the university. What are they feeding? They are feeding your intellect. Because they feel that the problem with the soul is it needs more information. Let's feed him with information. Fill him with information and he will be better. But have you noticed that even the most intelligent people have not been able to overcome sin in their intelligence? In fact, the, some of the most educated criminals are the most dangerous because they use that intellect to do, to will evil. They use that intellect to will plan schemes by which they rob people of, of whatever. So the solution to the, the, the soul is not more education, it's not more school, not more knowledge, not even religious knowledge. Amen. Not even religious knowledge. Amen. Say too much study in too much study what? There is no end. It makes you crazy. They told Paul, Paul, too much learning has made you mad. <laughs> too much learning has made you mad. Because he was a Pharisee. And they thought he was speaking as a Pharisee, but he was a Pharisee that had experienced a transformation. So what you need for your soul, first of all, is an illumination. It's light. The light of God to shine on your whole being. You know, the word that is used for transformation in the Bible is used in another passage, Mark chapter 9, to talk about the transfiguration. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. When Jesus took his disciples and he was transfigured before them. That is the same word that is used for transformation. Why is it that? Because you have to have some kind of light, a divine experience, a divine encounter with Jesus that would illuminate your soul to even begin or activate the process of renewing of your mind. Those who have gone to school have made us understand that school does not renew your mind. It's not about how much information you put in your mind, in your soul, that will renew your soul. It's having an encounter with Jesus, first of all, in the new birth. That begins the process of the renewing of the mind. It begins by an illumination that almost looks like the transfiguration of Jesus. The Bible says Jesus became, became he, he, he radiated like the sun. There was some light that came upon him, some supernatural encounter that transformed him. Another word that is used for that transformation is metamorphosis. And we all know what that is. It's the transformation of a lava, a caterpillar, to a butterfly. And if you look at that transformation, it is supernatural. It is totally different because a caterpillar looks nothing like a butterfly. And that is what transformation is all about. It begins the process of a real inward change. A real inward change. When your spirit comes to life, there is an illumination, an enlightenment of your soul that begins the process of 
renewing of the mind. It activates that process. It starts it. It's not the end. It's the beginning. So we all had that encounter when we met Jesus. When we received Jesus for the first time, there was an illumination in your soul. I remember for myself. I remember for myself like it was yesterday. I was preparing for A-levels. A-levels exam. I think I was 19. I was about to write the exam. Then Jesus came at the wrong time in my life. I threw away my physics books. My chemistry book made no sense to me. There was an illumination in my spirit. I, I could only read the Bible. I, the Bible just became like food to my soul. There was a hunger in me for the Bible. The Bible made sense. When I took physics, it did not make it, it was not as sweet. And I was about to write the A-levels. I had so many Bibles taken away by my dad. I would go to my pastor, my pastor would give me a Bible, I'll come home, I'll read from Genesis to like Leviticus. My dad would grab it and take it to his room and lock it. He said, you fill the exams. You're only reading the Bible. The, the problem is that before I got saved, I had never read the Bible. In fact, they told us in our church that if you read the Bible, you go crazy. It was a teaching. That is not for you. Your minds are too little. Those who have gone to seminary for seven years, they are even struggling to read. Who are you to read the Bible? In fact, it was, you, you don't, it, it, was, it was a very sacred book. To touch. To touch it even was a problem. Yeah, not actually reading, but they, they said if you read from beginning to end, that's it. You're, you're finished. You're, 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 you're only done. You read your own Bible. In fact, it was that bad. They even said if you take the Bible and hit it on somebody's ah. head, the person can read it. So we fear this book. We fear it. I grew up so afraid of the Bible, yeah. uh -huh. so so scared. And so when I got saved, my dad knew I was going crazy. <laughs> because I was doing the forbidden thing, I was reading the Bible. <laughs> Whenever he came to my room, I was reading the Bible. He would seize it and go and lock it up. So he had so many copies of my Bibles. And when I read it, I underline, I mark, I mark to remember. I, I, I would see Bible, it's marked from Genesis to Leviticus. Then you come and take another one from Leviticus to Joshua. <laughs> come and take another one from Joshua to Judges. It's Mark, 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 then New Testament. He had so many of my Bibles. What happened? There was an illumination that takes place at the new birth. That changes your mindset. God places in you a desire to begin to renew your mind. It was those years of reading the Bible that have made me what I am today. Mm -hmm. Amen. Those years gave me a foundation of God. I remember I read the book of Romans. I said, God, if they really said that one would be crazy, this, I think I'm getting crazy. I read the book of Romans. I said, God, I don't understand absolutely nothing. I read the book of Romans. He said, Romans chapter 6. Just, just read it for with me a little bit. It, it sounds, it sounded crazy. My God, I said, God, I, I don't understand anything you're saying here. It, say, it starts from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or, I read it, I said, God, this doesn't make any sense. And the, the only word I heard from the Spirit of God was read it again. Read it again. Read it again. I read and read and read and read. Then it started to dawn on me. It started to make sense. It started to add up. And when it started to add up, my excitement was over the roof. It's like, I just want to read it one more time. I just wanted to read it one more time. And that was my old mind being replaced by a new mindset. It's through the word of God. That's why God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart. Read it day and night. That is what begins the process of transformation. Before you even start to get transformed in your mind, 
What I wanted to really highlight now is that there is an illumination, an encounter by which Jesus shines on you. God shines on you and places in you the desire for his word. And when you start reading, like me, you will not understand. It doesn't make sense because all that makes sense is physics. The law of gravity, Newton's thermodynamic laws. I knew all of that. Energy, gravity, anything that goes up must come down. Makes sense. But that makes sense. But when you read the Bible, it says Jesus went up and went up. <laughs> Where was gravity? <laughs> you know, we need to renew our minds. And the process of renewing your mind. The, the, the Newton's laws of thermodynamics says when you step on water, you would see. But Jesus walked on water. The laws of biology say when you die, you are dead. They buried Lazarus for four days. And Jesus said, Come out. Come out. He came out. What is happening here? <laughs> this is not following the laws of nature. So it's the renewing of your mind. You start seeing the possibilities in impossibility. You start believing. I remember crazy things that I've done in my life. Like I gathered my family with a word from the Lord that I had to leave Sweden to Denmark. I gathered my family. I said, I'm leaving Sweden. I'm going to Denmark. And it will be well with me. I was doing a job. My friend said, keep your job. Move from Denmark from, to, come and Sweden, to come to Sweden and walk. Then take care of your family. So move gradually. It sounded like wisdom, but the wisdom I received from the Lord was that I was living in Sweden and walking in Denmark. Uh, no, no, I was living in Sweden and walking in Sweden, but the, 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 the wisdom I got from God was that he wanted me to live in a place where I can walk, I can go to church, I can attend the prayer meetings, mm -hmm. I can be part of the church community. So going to another country and coming to another country will not facilitate that for me. Mm -hmm. I took my entire family like Abraham. I resigned my job. Everybody thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy. <laughs> 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 but I have faith that God if, if I'm wrong about you, then I'm ready to die. Me and my family were going to perish. So we went to Denmark mm -hmm. and settled in. I started looking for jobs. And I was on vacation. So that my job gave me like a holiday. After resignation, you use your holiday days. Mm -hmm. I was being paid. Within 11 days, I got a job. Within 11 days. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen God do things. I've seen him do things over and over again. I know now that what he says in the word is true. And that has come through a long process of renewing of the mind. There are times when I did not trust God. There were times when I did not hear clearly. I learned to hear the will of God, to find the will of God in the midst of possibilities. And that's what this course is all about. It's leading us to a point where we can be able to find the will of God when it's not written in black and white. What church do I attend? Which city do I live in? What if your wife says, I want to live in Cameroon, and you say, I want to live in Canada? How will you find a solution? How will you find a solution? I will not take so much time today. I'll just leave it there. Amen. It's 9.30. There are two more classes. Today was introduction, and I just depended on, on God to just share from my heart some of my experiences. Next week, by the grace of God, we'll go deeper and dissect the scriptures and be able to see how this works for us Christians and how we can apply it into our lives. Amen. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for helping me to share from my heart what this course is all about. I pray that tomorrow you give us more and more so that we can be able to apply this in our ministry in our families, in our visions, in our callings. Now we can be able to think outside the box. We can be able to apply the scriptures to our daily lives and see what miracles for us in Jesus' name.
just bless everybody. I pray that we will have safely home, that our sleep will be sweet, that even in our dreams you will speak to us. We will not have nightmares. The devil will not come near our beds. Lord, your angels will guide us and protect us. We will be covered by the blood of Jesus. Even as we drive home, our driving shall be saved. Amen. And the rest of the week will be fruitful. Amen. And we shall come back next week. The devil shall not steal any one of us. Shall not deceive. Shall not steal the word that has been dropped in our hearts. Amen. To the glory of your name. Amen. I pray that you give us opportunity to grow. Amen. To be able to be able ministers yes, in our days, in our callings. 